Hello. Welcome to Stories in Time in Focus. I'm Eloise Schottler, your storyteller host, and I'm really glad you're here today. We have such a treat. We have, as you know, always a special guest, and today we have actor, performer, writer. She has a list of credentials of the things that she does. Kate Campbell Stevenson. Here in Montgomery County, we have this jewel, and she's with us today. Hi, Kate. Hi, Eloise. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, I'm really thrilled, because we haven't had anybody on this program that does the multitude of things that you do. And I think your special feature, if I said to you, well, Kate, what do you do? What's the first thing you would say? Sing. I identify as a singer, actor, but change maker, too. And what, because uh, I could think of another way for change, but what, what do you mean by change making? I hope through my programs and what I produce and perform that I do more than entertain, that I plant a seed to inspire the audience to find their passion to contribute in whatever way they want to contribute. Great, great. That's really a wonderful way. I'm glad I had you say that because yes. I would never have come to it in a million years. Uh, you live here in Montgomery County, don't you? I do, and I'm very proud of that. And why? Because I travel all over the world performing, and I feel so blessed to live here in Montgomery County. We have um, such diversity and such um, wonderful opportunities here. Mm -hmm. But now you're not originally from here. No, I'm originally from Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, I lived my first... 19 years, uh, 19, 20 years in Michigan. I moved out here when I was 20, and I've been here ever since. Well, so you I really, I really, you really am belong. a Marylander and Montgomery County yeah, president. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, that confronts you, doesn't it? You know, when I realized that I'd been in my house here for 40 years, right. I thought, well, right. you might as well claim this is home. That's you know, right. this is That's this is right. where you belong. Mm -hmm. You know, and it sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking when you started out. I looked at your bio, and you were trained as an actor yes. and singer. Right, right. I singer, actor. Uh, music is how I make my living. I've been singing and performing since I was a little girl, mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. And then I trained as an actor when I was in high school and have been performing professionally. Uh, ever since. Now, we haven't told people yet exactly what your programs are, and certainly you'd have to be an actor, storyteller, performer in order to do them. Uh, you perform as individual characters in a monologue or a presentation, having them work out their story, right? right? right. Okay, did you ever think when you were training as an actor, performing in a lot of, of uh, productions, et cetera, that you would be working on your own? Uh, actually, no, I didn't. I did, for 20 years, I did leading roles in Broadway musicals and regional theaters around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I uh, was getting a too long in the tooth to do um, uh, ingenue roles, I thought, why am I waiting around for somebody to do a role that's right for me? And I said, duh, create, I, I've gained all these skills. Let's create something that really can highlight what I do best. That's a real lesson for everybody to learn, isn't and I it? I do that. You know? I, I, I point that out when I go to, to schools mm -hmm. to say, you don't have to be uh, 40 years old before you um, can create a business around your special talents. In fact, start now. Well, exactly, but we don't look at ourselves that way, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a, now I looked up, and I'm going to have to, I'm sorry, I don't try not to use notes, but this woman has got quite a <laughs> list of characters that yes, she performs, indeed. and I'm so happy to see that they're women, and that you have a little bit of a feminist bit to these choices. I do. I do, and as a matter of fact, I deliberately chose all women mm -hmm. uh, because women's stories just have not been in the history books and they have not really been highlighted. And I think it's important whether you're a girl or a boy, man or a woman, to understand and learn these stories because we all can learn from these women and they are powerful uh, examples of how they broke through their barriers and obstacles to reach their goals and to make their dreams happen. Right. And if you're performing as them, telling their story, probably in their voice, in mm -hmm. their... In, oh, in yes. the, Yeah. Then you're not somebody else making a point. 
you're no, them. No, it's them. And trying to, I think the big part, especially as an actor, is to capture the passion, the real motivation behind each woman's story. Why? Did she care about the environment with mm -hmm. Rachel Carson? Right. And Bessie Coleman, why did she want to learn how to fly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what difference that made in her life and to the people that she inspired. Which one was the first one? The first person that I did? Yeah. Actually, I did Abigail Adams because oh, I... she's a classic. Yes, she's classic. Um, I had done... Um, Abigail Adams in the bicentennial production of 1776 with my husband, and it, uh, I knew that... You performed her? I actually, I was too young at that time. I did Martha Jefferson, mm -hmm. but I was very uh, aware of... Because of, uh, I love that play. Yes, yes, yes it's one of my musical. favorites. Yeah. And so um, I had access to the music. I knew it inside and out, and I, I thought, well, what a wonderful... Um, highlight to bring Abigail Adams because she was so instrumental in the f helping our uh, country right. form. And she wasn't just John Adams' wife. She was uh, a businesswoman. While Adams was away doing all of the politicking and trying to fo help form, deal with the um, different factions trying to uh, start our government, Abigail was home running the farm. She really was a businesswoman at a time when most women couldn't even enter into contracts, but she made it happen. Well, she was giving good advice, John. Remember the yes, women. Yes, she was. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And she was one of the first women, first people to really speak up and be an advocate for women. Mm -hmm. Remember the ladies. Right. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that it turned out to be a popular way to work? Actually, for me, Popular well, I mean, if people receive this, I mean, your your uh, comments and everything are glowing. Did it start off that way, or did you have to build an audience for it? And actually, no. It, it was very, very exciting. I started off thinking I was, my children were my inspiration in doing this. And I started off, um, I said, I saw my daughter pulling back and not wanting to stick out, dumbing down in class uh, when she was in fourth and fifth grade. And she's brilliant, not just because she's my daughter, but she is. And I saw her peers doing the same thing. And I was furious as a woman, as a mother, to see this happening. I did that when I was growing mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as an adult, um, watching this be perpetuated, I said, I've got to do something. So this was my call to action. Mm -hmm. to highlight women and show my daughter and my son that women have been there all along. They've been change makers. They have been strong leaders in our culture, in government even, though they didn't get the recognition. They worked right alongside the men, but we didn't get any credit for it. And I'm trying to highlight those stories as so we can learn from them. Yeah and apply some of their tremendous lessons and how they broke through barriers and be inspired by their stories to say, hey, if Bessie Coleman, who was a black female aviator in the 1920s, and she was uh, very poor from the South, uh, and she wanted to learn how to fly. Uh, of course, women didn't fly then, and African-American women, no African-American was flying at that time. If Bessie Coleman could make her goals, her dreams happen, then we have no excuses today. No. This is interesting. When I read the list, there are, and I've got a question I want to ask you, but about Bessie Coleman, you know, everybody or most people who go for women and aviators go for Amelia Earhart. Right. So how come that you chose Bessie Coleman? Because of this character of her? Well, actually, it was very fascinating. I wanted to portray an African-American woman. And I was reading a book uh, by Janet Daly called Silver Wings in Santiago Blue about how the women were pilots during World War II, the, the wasps. wasps. Right. And so uh, I thought, wow, that is really cool. I wonder if there were any early African-American pilots because that's, a, that's exciting to present, uh, you know, women flying. And so I went to my local library in Montgomery County and I typed in, this was almost 20 years ago, so I typed in uh, female aviator, African-American, and it spat out only one, uh, only one book, and it was called Queen Bess Darede Daredevil Aviator by Doris Rich. And she also was a local writer here. And 
it was in my local library. And I said, it's a sign. Yes, I this should say. This is fabulous. <laughs> I should I'll say go so. for it. I should and say. I wanted to do that because everybody knew about um, Amelia Earhart. That's right. There's no and secret there. And what I wanted to do was, um, you know, go beyond the five wonderful women that have been portrayed in, in history books, only five basically, Helen Keller, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, uh, the Tubman, Harriet Tubman. Right, Alice Paul maybe. Uh, no, Alice Paul was not being portrayed in oh. the history books then, no, not yeah. at all. And most people had not a clue about Alice Paul. Um, you know, so I wanted to go beyond that, and Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually there was only this one book about Bessie Coleman at the time. Shortly after that, a stamp came out about Bessie Coleman. But it's to bring to life, m there are millions of women's stories that That's we right. need to learn. That's so right. why, you know, why emphasize somebody that the students already know? I think that's a terrific point, you know, that uh, what you're doing is bringing forth. Now, let, we're going to be short time for this set, but I just want to know, which one of your choices has been the, could you say, was the biggest risk? I say uh, Bessie Coleman, mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure how people would react, uh, the audiences, if I were doing an African American. I don't put on heavy makeup or dark makeup at all, but I do have a little bit of darker makeup, but it's just a, a hint. Uh, but part of changing wigs and makeup and costumes is a big hook in my in my show. How I how I make everything happen, and I wasn't sure how it was going to um, go come out. But what was so exciting is that my very first gig was in Prince George's County at High Point High School. Now I didn't know that high school is the toughest audience, uh, and I just went you know went full speed ahead and and did it, and. The students there were 98% African American. At at uh, how did they accept it? It was wonderful. They loved it. As a matter of fact, one I, my thrust of my show at that time was writing your goals down, and one 10th grade girl went back to class, wrote down, uh, wrote a personal note to me, and asked her teacher if she could come back and give it to me. And while I was packing up, she gave it to me. Her name was Erica Rose. And I, she said, if, if I could do what you do, that I, I would be so happy. I love the sparkle in your eye and Abigail Adams. Yeah. I, I want to sing. I want to be a performer. So I actually, when I read the note on the way home, and I stopped, and I basically cried. I said, it works. It works. <laughs> it works, yes. If these young people, which was supposed to be the toughest audience, really were engaged and got a lot out of it, then I, I knew I was on the right track. That's fabulous. And with, with your saying that, I noticed when I was looking at your website, we haven't talked much about this, and I hope that we'll have a chance. A student in Silver Spring put up a, uh, gave a message that says, when you change costumes, magic happens. Mm -hmm. So it's the character, and you create it in 3D. Right. Uh, it's, I, it's so powerful, instead of just reading about these women in a book, to actually become them. And the students, you can usually hear a pin drop. And I, uh, they can see me, of course, when I'm performing in front of them. But I watch them. And usually the young students have their mouths open, gaping, and just how does she do that? Or, or, and, and it's really exciting for me to see them so engaged. And in the stories, they really, I usually do three women in a show, and they watch me go from the transitions, and they buy right into it. They're absorbed. They ask questions afterwards about, well, what happened afterwards? Or, or um, did, the, did she really, did Rachel Carson, what happened to Rachel Carson? Right. after the time when I um, have well, her testifying. You can see, we're going to have to leave now for just a moment. Don't go away, because when you come back, Kate is going to tell us a story. I don't think we're going to get a costume version. No. She's going to tell us a personal story. So come right back. The pain will not control us. It will never break us define us, 
or keep us still. Because arthritis can't beat us if we beat it first. In the fight against arthritis, you need a weapon. What's yours? Visit the Arthritis Foundation at fightarthritispain.org. I wanted to share a story about my mother. Julianne Elise Freund Campbell. She was a major influence on my life, as I'm sure most mothers are. Some have some stories, mother-daughter stories, can be rather complicated. Mine was pretty simple. My mother was fabulous. She was reserved, quiet woman, but she was a pillar of strength. But I really didn't understand that when I was growing up because I'm a product of the 50s. My mom was, met my father during the war and married in 1947, had her first child, a son, in 49, and another one two years later, and then twins. I'm an identical twin. Four children in six years, and she had her hands full. And she was a typical woman of that time, of the 50s. She was busy raising her children at home, and she didn't work outside the home. Occasionally, she helped my father at his office. My father was a surgeon. But my mother was the power behind the throne. And I never really understood that because my mom was just mom. She was always there. We'd walk home from school, and she was there to make our lunch. And she would take us to all of our sporting events. I remember dad giving her a taxi cab hat when uh, we were in high school because she was always driving people everywhere that needed to be. She dealt with a lot of challenges in her lifetime. She didn't have a particularly happy relationship with her own mother. And she was so afraid that we would feel that way about her. Mom, I can guarantee you, we didn't. Her lessons to us were quiet. She lived out every day her own personal beliefs and how she felt people should be treated. She was a reserved woman and very classy. And I never heard her say a bad word about anybody. And as an adult, I try to remember what, how my mom lived her life. She didn't preach to us. She taught us about right and wrong. But it was how she lived her life. And I lost her when she was, I was 27, and my mother was 57. For eight years, she had been ill with cancer. And instead of us taking care of mom, she took care of us. People thought she was going to die within three months. She said, no way. She got all three of her surviving children married, and her husband retired before she finally succumbed. But it was not really until after she died that I started finding out things about my mom, that she was an adventurer. When she was in college, she went to Mexico and worked with the Friends Society in helping rebuild towns. Why did I have to wait that long to find out about my mom? She never talked about herself. She was always promoting others. And I think that's why I went into storytelling, because I realized how important it is that we learn how our parents overcame their, adversary, their problems, their barriers and obstacles, and that we can learn from them. But she was always so encouraging to so many people. As a matter of fact, well, my mom's name was Julianne, and there are scores and scores 
of the next generation that are named Julianne because of her influence on their parents' lives. So many women in my small town of Ionia, Michigan, that's where I grew up, there were about 7,000 area residents. My mom was a, a doctor's wife, and she lived in a, a lovely home that she worked really hard to, to remodel. And there was not a whole lot of places for us to go in this little town, so she wanted to make sure that our home was inviting to our friends so we could invite them over and have a safe place to play. Also, she was very much into um, sports. Her first job after college was teaching disadvantaged students how to swim at the local Y in a small town in Iowa. And of course, I found this out later, too. She was always reaching out and, and helping people. There was no place for our uh, students in our town to work out uh, in gymnastics. And this is long before Nadia Komenich and how popular gymnastics is now. My parents bought the equipment and set up a gym in our backyard that was open to so many people to come and to practice. In 1972, we had their 25th wedding anniversary. And my mom had been mom to over 25 young men that she'd helped over the years invited them to live in our home for months at a time, uh, wrote them letters, and they all came from all over the country to surprise my parents for their wedding anniversary and to honor, particularly my mother, for the support that she gave them. So I learned about mom, from mom, how to live my life, but I want to make sure that I share my stories with my children uh, because I feel lost, that so sad about the stories being lost about my mom. And I, I, I think it's so important to preserve stories. She was beautiful inside and out. And my daughter has her name, Juliana. And I hope to be able to share more stories as I gather them to younger generations to know how important it is to live your life. She's my greatest role model. Live out your values. And I am forever grateful that she allowed us to be whomever we wanted to be, but to do our very best every day. And I look at that picture of mom. It's on my bedside table every day. And we try to live up to her standards. Always be positive, never say a bad, bad word about anybody, and to reach down and out into the community and to help whenever you can. It's a simple story, but very, very powerful, how we all can make a difference. And I learned that from my mother. I told you we'd come back. Here we are. Now, was that wonderful or what? To have Kate tell us that wonderful story about her mother. How did that feel? Well, it felt really good. I haven't really talked about my mom in any of my shows in the you know formal sense. Uh, I, I do bring up a few things now and then at the end when I'm tying things together. But there's so much to tell. That's my problem is trying to, trying to 
hone down the stories. Yeah. She's an was an amazing woman. I think one of the things that I loved when you said she was fabulous mm -hmm. and then started doing that, and shouldn't we all be looking at our mothers and the women in our lives mm -hmm. so that uh, following Kate's example, we could tell a little story mm -hmm. about them. Mm -hmm. Talking about that, how do you add characters? Well, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math has become quite a buzzword in the last, an emphasis in the last decade. And I thought, well, I would... You mean in the schools? In the school, and oh, all over. In schools, careers, and so on. We need to influence and develop more science, technology, engineering, and math leaders. And to get young girls, particularly, interested in the STEM classes. And to understand that they can do it. Uh, so many times over the decades, oh, you were, young girls were steered away from science or math. Oh, girls aren't good at math. Oh, yes, they are. But they've been steered away from it. We need to encourage everybody, girls included, to become active and to give themselves the challenge of being in those classes. And so I've added um, several role models and could put a show together highlighting uh, historical women who've made advances in STEM fields and also in the new STEM show Forging Frontiers I also at the end highlight contemporary women leaders so my audience members can see hey women are in the fields mm -hmm. making great progress mm -hmm. doing wonderful things when are you next going to do that show? I have a wonderful show coming up at Montgomery College. Oh, good. April 4th, 7 o'clock. In our neighborhood. Yes, that is in good. at the Rockville campus. Okay. And it's to uh, open and celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Science Day events that Montgomery College has been having every year. Rockville oh, okay. and Montgomery College has been having okay. every year. And so uh, I'm going to be kicking off um, that weekend event. Um, the Science Day is on this April 6th, and my, my show will be on April 4th. And I'm looking forward to oh, doing cool. the, the Do you know show. how people should find out about it? Just the well, website for Montgomery College? Montgomery College, and there will be publicity coming out about it. It's all tied into the science and engineering festival that's done on the, the mall in downtown D.C. Uh, so there's information that will be coming out that's all tied together. But I'll put it on my Facebook, I'll put it on my website, and, and uh, we'll, have, we'll try to get the word out. And as you'll as travel it? Oh, yes. Actually, I am traveling it already. Oh, cool. I did it for the AAUW uh, State Convention last year, American Association of University Women, and I will be performing it uh, for several conferences and conventions between now and then. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. We've just run out of time. Kate, I'm so glad oh. you were here. I'm particularly glad to have had a chance to talk to you. You have to come back. There are a lot of things that I didn't find out that I wanted to, and I know that we've opened the topic for you, and don't forget, April the 4th, look around for that. I think it's going to be a wonderful occasion out at Montgomery College, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.